Thanks, Joey. I always love hearing that passage. I just love it. It's so fresh and new and beautiful and good. And it should give us a great sense of hope because that's the world that God wants to recreate. A new heavens and a new earth when Jesus returns. It's good to know that the world was once good. And we're doing a new series at the moment called The Air We Breathe. And it's looking at the fact that We breathe the air that we breathe today and we may not really recognise the air that we breathe because that's just our air. But the cultural air that we breathe today is something that didn't exist a long time ago and doesn't still exist in some places. But it's been changed, it's different and it's given us certain values and uh, anticipation for what life should be about. And so we're looking at this in our series. Now, last week, we looked at the context of Western culture and how different it is to historical times, which Jesus lived in before the Jesus revolution began, known as Christianity. Each week, we're going to be examining a new core value. And the values are equality, compassion, consent, enlightenment, science, freedom and progress. Now, we're going to do this by travelling back through the Bible and through history. And today, we're starting right back at the beginning of Bible and the beginning of time. And it's here that we're going to identify the value that is actually the foundation for all others, that every person is equally valuable. And if you're following along in the sermon notes today, then you'll notice that's the first point. Every person is equally valuable. So have that in your mind. That's what we're looking at today. That's part of the air that we breathe. So let's pray and then we'll continue. Lord God... We want to hear from you today. We want to sense where you're directing us. And we want to have a sense that this is not just up to us, but that your power is at work in our world and in our lives. Because God, we recognise that we cannot hold this value on our own. It took the Jesus revolution to change people's minds about this, And it still takes the revolutionary power of Jesus to help our minds to think this way today in the most practical and in the hardest of times. So, Lord, help us to hear you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me take you back to those tumultuous times of the COVID era, back in January 2021. There was a TV interview which was held with a guy by the name of Lord Sumption. He was a former UK Supreme Court Justice. And as he was being interviewed, he said these words. He said, I don't accept that all lives are of equal value. So what do you think the response was? Just turn to the person next to you and tell him what you think the response was to that phrase. I wonder what your response is to that particular phrase. As far as the media went, the reaction was instantaneous. The phone calls came into the BBC hotline. The the Twitter feeds lit up. I think it was Twitter back then and not X. The response was huge. Now, Lord Sumption was speaking in the context of COVID lockdowns and the development of policies and the allocation of resources. He reasoned that while the elderly were more affected by COVID, the illness, the young were more negatively affected by the lockdown. And this prompted the question, if you do not lock down, are the elderly to be sacrificed for the good of the young? And Sumption's answer was, My children and my grandchildren's lives are worth more than mine because they got a lot more of it ahead. Now, 
during, an, during the interview, Sumption was confronted on air by Deborah James, who was a woman vulnerable to COVID due to her cancer. She replied, with all due respect, I am the person who you say their life is not valuable. And Sumption interrupted her with a clarification that really helped no one. He said, I didn't say that your life was not valuable, I said it was less valuable. <laughs> not worthless, just worth less. The idea that someone is worth less than another doesn't go down well in our society, does it? Deborah James replied, she said, who are you to put a value on life? In my view, and I think in many others, life is sacred and I don't think we should make those judgment calls. All life is worth saving regardless of what life it is people are living. Now notice her description, notice that key word there, life is sacred. In his book, The Air We Breathe, Glenn Scrivener points out that when the notion of equal human rights is under pressure and under threat, we can't help shift our language to the religious. To speak of a hierarchy of human worth becomes sacrilegious, it becomes a transgression, it's a blasphemy, at least in our world it is. But as we saw last week, it isn't always that way. It wasn't always that way, especially in the world of the people who lived in the Greek and Roman Empire. If the Greek philosopher Plato, who stated that barbarians are worth less than Greeks and women are worth less than men and free men, sorry, slaves are worth more, worth less than free men, if Plato had had his opinion then he would have wondered what the problem was in thinking that all lives weren't of the same value. He would say the reason is obvious from nature itself. People have different attributes, different abilities, different amounts of wealth and power and wisdom. Some are strong and some are weak. Surely you see some people are more valuable than others, he would say. He might even politely say to us, Clearly, equality is very important to you. You live your life in light of this belief, and I can respect that. But to me, it looks as if you've just decided to believe in something with no reason or evidence. I'm afraid I'm not convinced. Now, interestingly, this is how some people might actually consider God. A nice idea with no reason to believe in it. But here's the thing. We do believe in things that cannot be seen and even may run contrary to what we observe in nature. And one of those things is human rights. The evolutionary historian who wrote a book called Sapiens and other books, a guy called Yuval Noah Harari, writes this about human rights. He says, they are not an objective reality. They're not a biological fact about homo sapiens. Take a human being, cut him open, look inside, you'll find the heart, the kidneys, the neurons, hormones, DNA, but you won't find any rights. The only place you find rights is in the stories that we have invented and spread over the last few centuries. They may be very positive stories, very good stories, but they are still just fictional stories that we've invented. Now, he makes a very good biological point about the biological evidence for human rights and equal worth. I mean, the reality is we share 40% of our genetic code with bananas. <laughs> but that's not saying anything about the worth of humans or bananas. Yet most of us don't think a genetic difference between humans is any reason for thinking that one is worth less than the other. Moreover, according to biochemist Anne-Marie Helmenstein, we are materially worth about seven to eight dollars worth of elements if you boiled it all down, broke it down and then sold it off. But biological worth is very different to ultimate worth, isn't it? Lord Sumption tried to salvage his position in these interviews by making a follow-up statement in his next interview. He said this, 
It doesn't matter that people, sorry, it doesn't mean that people are morally worthless. It doesn't mean that they're worthless in the eyes of God or in the eyes of their fellow citizens. Now, that's better. That's getting better. But then he caused the studio to erupt again when he followed up with, but sometimes policymakers have to say some lives are worth more than others. As objective as we might try to be, there is something within our society that just cannot abide the notion that some lives are worth more than others. So we're confronted with this reality in the air that we breathe today. And this is the next point in your outline. As humans, we see differences, but what we seek is equality and worth. As humans, we see differences, but what we seek is equality and worth. Sure, nature highlights our physical and our intellectual differences. Our selfish nature condemns others for their differences. Our sensitive nature feels condemned because of our differences. But there remains a part of us that wants to know that we are just as worthwhile as any other person. And what the Jesus revolution that shaped Western culture 2,000 years ago pointed out was that humans have a very unique quality to their nature that makes every person valuable. It is our godly nature. Humans were made, as we read in the book of Genesis, were made in the image of God. The majority of our society today still wants to say that everyone has worth, no matter where you come from, what has happened to you, what you have, what you don't have, who you are. But where did that idea come from? Because it wasn't in Greek philosophy. It wasn't in Roman culture. In fact, in Roman culture, it was commonplace to dump baby girls on the side of the road simply because they weren't the sons that the family was looking for. So where did this idea of equal human worth come from? Well, Lord Sumption, strangely enough, already tilted at it. He said it doesn't matter, sorry, it doesn't mean that they're worth less in the eyes of God. In the eyes of God. This idea that there is someone who sees things from an objective point of view and says, you matter. You are valuable. Sure, we look at our lives now and we think, well, you know, biologically, we're only worth about seven or eight bucks. We look at our lives socially And sometimes when we look at our lives socially, depending on what you read in social media, depending on what you hear from different people, depending on what the bullies in the playground say about you, you may feel as though you're worth less than seven or eight bucks. We need someone who's going to convey upon us some kind of value. It doesn't mean that they're worth less in the eyes of God but not just any God. We already know the disregard that Greek and Roman gods had for human beings. In many world cultures, even today, we see this. In animistic tribal cultures, we see people of different tribes who consider those of other tribes to be less than human. In India, there are still many people who hold to the Hindu religious caste system, that has a category of people who are actually completely ignored, the untouchables. Where did this worth, this idea of worth come from? It comes from the very first section of Genesis, right at the start of the Bible, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female, he created them. 
Now, you will hear me and you will hear other preachers and theologians say that the Bible is all about God. It's a very important thing to recognise, that the main character in the Bible is God, that the Bible isn't written to tell us that we should follow this person or that person, it's telling us about God. But the Bible is a story, not of God out there, the Bible is the story of God down here among us. The story is not about God out there. The story is about God down here with us, among us. A God who values us so that he creates a place for us and then comes to be with us. He longs to dwell with us. The Bible is a story not about God out there. It is the story of God down here. John chapter 1, at the beginning of his story, his account of Jesus, the Apostle John says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And of course, as Matthew describes at the beginning of his gospel, they will call him, Jesus, Emmanuel, which means God with us. It's a story not of God out there, but it's a story of a God down here with us. The stories of the Greek and Roman gods are all about them carrying on and arguing and fighting with each other and how humans were just a side effect far more than a benevolent gesture. In ancient Babylon, humans were created as slaves to the gods. In the world of the ancients, it's no wonder that people thought that humans, being just the outcome of a a cosmic battle or accident, or created as slaves, it's no no wonder that ancient people would have thought that human life was cheap and inconsequential to anyone but precious few. But the God described in the Hebrew Bible was different. In Psalm chapter 116, we read, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Precious. That description that Jesus gives of human beings in the Gospels is radically contrary to the mythic Olympian gods. Listen to what Jesus says. Luke 12 He says, what is the price of five sparrows? Is it two copper coins? Mm -hmm. Yet God does not forget a single one of them. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered and known by God. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Astoundingly, on the first page of the Bible, we do not read of God asserting his dominance over the world. Instead... This is what we read. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Humankind is not meant to slave. Humankind was made to reign. In the very first chapter of the Bible... God doesn't put his thumb down. God actually holds his hand out and gives to humanity the role of reigning on earth. Male and female together, kings and queens, vice regents, stamped with the image and the likeness of God. Now, the ancients would have spat out their tea if they heard this. Male and female equality in God's image, equally reigning over God's world, unheard of. The king alone may have been the image of a God, ruling forcefully and tyrannically, just like the gods, but not today, not in our world. That is not how we think. People in the West don't think of God that way. They expect God to be generous and helpful. Stephen Fry, the comedian and author, is well known for an oft-quoted rant 
that he made about Christianity when he accused God of being capricious and mean-minded because of the suffering and injustice seen in the world. Yet what Stephen Fry never realised was that his very reason for expecting God to be that way was because he grew up in a society saturated by Christian values. Genesis sees God as remarkably benevolent. Psalm 115 reminds us, The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the human race. The Bible conveys a sense of blessing, not cursing, of gifts, not demands flowing from above, from heaven to earth, through humanity. Dominion, not subjection, is our lot. And here's the thing, our kind of dominion is meant to be a picture of God's power wielded for the benefit of all, especially those without it. So that's the next point. Our kind of dominion is meant to be a picture of God's dominion, the power that's wielded for the benefit of all, especially those who are without it. Jesus takes it even further. In Mark chapter 9, verse 35, he says, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. And in John 15, he says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. You know, the Greeks and the Romans used to try and do this. They tried treating each other as the stories of their gods told them that they treated human beings. And so you saw domination, you saw inequality, you saw a ruthless lack of compassion. Jesus says, my command to you is this, love one another as I have loved you. Now, let's return to Lord Sumption for a moment. And the very real challenges that we face on a planet of 8 million people. He was speaking in this very Genesis-like context of dominion. People in positions responsible for managing resources. So, do we estimate life on a scale? Do we measure human life on a scale of high worth to low worth? based on age and ability and productivity? Or do we consider human life differently? How then does that affect how you treat those that you work with, those that you live with, those that you live nearby, those that you vote for, those that you visit, that you speak to, that you smile at, that you give to? You know, it wasn't just the early followers of the Jesus Revolution who thought about these things. It was their critics who recognised the dramatic difference their ideas made, this idea of equality. One of the most outspoken critics of Christianity was a guy by the name of Celsus, who lived about 180 AD when he wrote these words. He said, The radical error in Jewish and Christian thinking is that it is anthropocentric, which means human-centred. They say that God made all things for man, but this is not at all evident. In no way is man better in God's sight than ants and bees. Now, Celsus, of course, was following in the fine tradition that Plato had set up for us, that nature knows no sense of equality. It was arrogance to think that God specially blesses humans and sheer lunacy to think that God would become a human being. But for those who had glimpsed a different kind of God in the Genesis account and in the person of Jesus, this made perfect sense. In fact, if men and women were made to have dominion, then, of course, the true cosmic king would turn up as a human. Because humans were made in the very image of the creator king himself. As Glenn Scrivener writes, 
He says, of course he enters history, centre stage in this way. Humanity is the location he prepared for himself right back in the beginning. To become human is exactly the sort of thing this God would do. And he did it so as to take the wheel of his own world and guide creation home. Last point. You see, even though humans tend to make a mess of the world, God does not see us as any less valuable. Even though humans tend to make a mess of the world, God does not let, see us as any less valuable. You read that creation story in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, it's beautiful, it's fantastic, it's wonderful, it's fresh, it's new, it's empowering, it's encouraging. And then you get to Genesis 3 and the mess begins. And humans decide to leave the original vision that was there. And they make a mess of the world. And we look at our world today. And we look at the causes of the messes in our world. They're human made. But you know what? God doesn't see us as any less valuable. Even though our capacity, even though... Uh, what we have done, our track record, is rotten. God has still not lowered us on the level of worth. That God has continued to highly value human beings. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, the writer Paul says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He came into the world to save people who had messed up who did have diminished capacity. History shows that that critic, Celsus, lost the argument and the idea of equal human worth stemming from bearing of the image of God meant that human rights and even humanism can trace its roots back to this biblical root. So this raises a question for us to consider as we close. As to what might remain of human rights and equality if we removed that foundational belief in God. If we decide to go with Celsus and the ancient world, then we will think, quit your human centeredness. The gods don't care and nature is unequal. If we consult atheistic anthropologists like Harari, we think, the struggle for survival is indifferent and viciously unequal. Human rights are as fictional as the God who underwrites them. If we feel that life is sacred, that every human possesses an inviolable dignity and worth and equality, and that no one deserves to be trampled down simply because they're smaller or weaker or poorer, then we are standing on particularly biblical foundations. What is apparent is that the God story and the equality story are actually inseparable. They stand or fall together. Discard one and you discard the other. Lose this God and you've lost the reason for equality. Lose equality and you've lost your understanding of this God. But follow this God seen in Jesus and you'll find yourself following a thread running from Genesis through the New Testament, straight through to our 21st century human anthropocentric convictions. It is the thread that the modern world hangs by. But thanks to the Creator, it is strong enough to hang everything on today and tomorrow. God sees you as of valuable, infinite worth. He's willing to invest himself in you, to allow you to be those who have dominion over this world so that you can exercise his good and beautiful reign for every creature, for every living thing on this planet. God still wants to change and transform who we are into who we could be. Now the question is, what and who do you hang your life upon? 
What and who will you hang everyone else's life upon? Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you that you came and dwelt with us in history. Thank you for Jesus of Nazareth, a human being who lived in history and yet proved himself not simply to be a human being but to be God made human. Thank you for the life that he lived, the things that he said, the way that he treated people. Thank you for the way that he showed us the heart of God. Thank you that he came and he said, you are so valued by God, do not worry. Trust in me, trust in him. Thank you that Jesus came and he said, here's the really important command, love one another, just as I have loved you. And we thank you that that same Jesus overcame death, went to death because of us on our behalf, died because of the messed up sinfulness and violence of human beings and yet was willing to carry that sinfulness into the grave and bury it there and then was raised again to life, demonstrated that these things, that sin could be overcome if we relied on him and went his way. So, Lord, today we want to confess that sometimes we buy into this idea of inequality that creeps into our world. And we have forgotten to stick with the value of equality that you established. Lord, some of us have felt as though we are less than worthwhile because of what other people have said and done or because of something in us which we think is an inadequacy, or someone else told us it was inadequacy. But Lord, you look at us and you don't see those things. You love each one of us. We are so valuable to you. You would give your own life for us so that we might have your life. You treasure us so much that you would love us to have eternal life with you forever, to live in a renewed world. And so, Father, we pray, would you help us to grasp that? Would you help us to know that we are loved? Would you help us to know that we are not worth less than others? Lord, some of us need to confess to you that sometimes we think of others as being worthless. We have sometimes seen others because of some attribute that they have or because of something that they have done as being less worthy. And Lord, we want to repent of that. We pray that you will help us to be people who love, not people who hate. God, we know that our world needs each one of us to exercise the kind of dominion that you exercised. You have given us this role. Lord, help us to fulfil it the way that you do. Help us to care for our planet. Help us to care for the creatures that live here. Help us to care for one another. In the same way that you, the great and loving creator, cared for us and continue to do so by your Holy Spirit here with us. So finally, we ask, God, would you help us as we leave? Help us to continue to hang our life upon the thread which you began and you will bring to completion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.